When I woke up, I had got cut six times down my left thigh, one time across the left side of my neck, once across the right, twice through my right ribs, cut out my right pec, bottom of my armpit to the bottom of my hand, 350 staples in my body, bandaged me from my neck to my knees. And so immediately when I woke up, I knew my life had changed. Everything that I once knew, everything that I was once working for, when I went to sleep that night going into surgery, the next day I woke up, my life looked different, like physically look different. My career ended, right? And I'm so grateful for that day. I'm so grateful for that moment because it introduced me to a lot of things that I didn't know exist in me, but also it introduced me into a lot of things just in terms of what I felt God had in store for my life. And so I'm extremely grateful for it. What's up, everybody? It's your girl, Brandi Harvey. I am so excited that you have decided to join us for today's insightful, thoughtful, thought-provoking conversation. Y'all, welcome to Vault and Powers Talks. But I am, I, I'm excited for this one. This is the last one of the day. Y'all don't know the behind the scenes stuff, but this is the last one of the day. And I get the pleasure of talking with a master motivator. And Corius Inky Johnson <laughs> is one of the most sought after motivational speakers in the world. Having graced the stages of Fortune 500 and 100 companies, sports teams, and Hall of Fame inductions, Inky's message of faith, adversity, and triumph has put him in a class all by himself. He mm -hmm. is a husband, he is a father, and the host of the Serendipity Podcast. Vault Empowers Talks. Welcome to the show, the master motivator himself, Mr. Inky Johnson. If I could clap with two hands right now, <laughs> I would stand up and just clap. For but I hit, I hit my leg. For you yourself. Know? No, for you. For, for you. yourself. It's such an honor, though. Yeah. It's such an honor. I'm grateful to be here with you. Got a lot of respect and admiration uh, for you, for what you do and how you do it. Just thank you so much for letting Listen, me share this moment. Listen, this is, I feel like for the interviews that I've done today, you know, all of them have been like interviews in the making. Right. Mm. You know, um, friends or distant friends, like gotcha. friends through friends. And okay. you are that because yeah. we've had some like potential events together Absolutely. and all the things. And yeah, I'm down. And, it, you know, just the stars hadn't aligned. Absolutely. And now here we are. And Absolutely. so that's the beauty of this. So I'm a divine. I am. I'm excited for this because, you know, you and I were talking offline. I make all these notes all the time and mm -hmm. then I end up like just sitting them down yeah. because like I've done so much research on you. And I told you before, you know, I don't want this to be like the run of the mill interview Absolutely. like you always do, you of know, course. because everybody goes back to September, September 9th. Absolutely. September 9th, 2006. Yeah. You're playing in the game at Tennessee. You were playing for Tennessee, and mm -hmm. you have a, a life-threatening injury mm -hmm. that happens on the field. Absolutely. And it totally changes the trajectory of your life. Mm -hmm. And so there are people who may not be familiar with mm -hmm. what happened to you. So just kind of briefly give an overall synopsis of that day. Yeah, so September 9th, 2006... I was a projected draft pick. I was in my junior year. Headed to the NFL. Yep, to the NFL as a cornerback. And, um, you know, I went out to make a routine tackle. Second game of my junior year, fourth quarter, two minutes left. And at the point of contact, it seemed as if every breath of my body left. Body went completely limp. Got rushed to the hospital from the field. Ended up rupturing my main artery in my chest, my subclavian artery. They had to rush me back and save my life because I was bleeding internally. But when they rushed me back to do the surgery, they noticed I had torn the nerves in my brachial plexus, which were the nerve roots that came from my spine that controlled shoulder, arm, hand, fingers. And when I woke up, I had got cut six times down my left thigh, one time across the left side of my neck, once across the right, twice through my right ribs, cut out my right pec, bottom of my armpit to the bottom of my hand, 350 staples in my body, Bandaged me from my neck to my knees. And so immediately when I woke up, I knew my life had changed. Like everything that I once knew, everything that I was once working for, when I went to sleep that night going into surgery, the next day I woke up, my life looked different. Like physically yeah. looked different. Yeah. And uh, my career ended, 
right? And I'm so grateful for that day. I'm so grateful for that moment because it introduced me to a lot of things that I didn't know exist in me, but also it introduced me into a lot of things just in terms of what I felt God had in store for my life. And so I'm extremely grateful for it. I mean, here's what, what was so powerful for me in, in listening to you tell your story is that you said my arm was paralyzed, not my heart. <laughs> right. My heart wasn't paralyzed. It, that there was still something inside of you that you knew you were called to do. Absolutely. But you didn't think that it was public speaking. No. Because you, you quit that the second day you was in the class. No you question. was like, this ain't for me. No question. But somehow when this injury happens, you get to keep telling your story because people are intrigued now. They're like, well, what happened? Right. <laughs> what, what happened, dog? Right. Tell me. What, what happened? No no and so that's how you start telling your story. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was, you know, for me in the early stages, it was almost therapeutic for me. Yeah. Like it was a form of therapy. I wasn't doing it with the intent to speak. It was almost I would be out doing service projects and people would be like, hey, man, what happened? And just naturally, my personality, I'm reserved, right? I'm laid back. I'm chill. And so I was never sharing what happened to me with the intent of, oh, man, I think one day I'll travel around the world and speak. Yeah. They would say, what happened? I would say, football injury. Yeah. And there would always be somebody like, no, what happened? Like, your arm looks different yeah. than your other arm. Like, what happened? Then I would be like, I made a tackle in the game, hit, and somebody would keep pressing the issue. Then I would share it, and somebody would always be like, man, you need to speak. And I'd be like, nah, I'm cool on that. Right? Like, that's not what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Like, I'm trying to coach. Right? And like you said, when they put me in public speaking in college, I dropped the class on the second day, right? Because I was like, man, I'm not speaking. Like, I, I won't need that. Like, that's not something yeah. I'll be doing. Yeah. And I'll never forget, I called my high school coach, and he was like, Ink, you never know, man. You might need that one day, <laughs> right? And I'm like, nah, coach, I'm good, man. I'm yeah. going to go to the league. And so even after my injury happened, I never thought I would be doing what I'm doing. And so that's why it comes with a heavy level of gratitude and respect because it has happened the way that it has. Yeah. Because I wasn't chasing it. And so I know it was God. Yeah. And so I look at it totally different. Yeah. yeah. Most people who are called to something that's so much higher and greater than them, they're never chasing that thing. No question. It's always chasing them down. No question. 100%. 100%. <laughs> yeah. And so you found yourself, it was chasing you down, but mm -hmm. you weren't really making any money off of it. You was getting <laughs> mugs and you was getting t-shirts <laughs> for showing up and, you know, your wife was kind of like, okay, now, no what, what, what are we doing with this? No question. And really this kind of came at a very low point in your life. Yeah. You were, this is after the injury has happened, yeah. after you've gone through the therapy for it, mm -hmm. there was a real low point that you hit in your life. Yeah, and it was it wasn't it wasn't normal for me. You know, I tell people often like I was always an optimistic guy. Like even when I was a kid, you know, I grew up in the city of Atlanta, right in the heart of Atlanta, two bedroom house, fourteen people. Wow. And I was always just optimistic. Even in that circumstance, I felt like, man, one day I'm gonna do something great. Yeah. Like one day I'm gonna make good on our family's name. Like even when the injury happened. You know, people were viewing it as a tragedy. I never looked at it that way. Right? Never once. I never looked at it as you a tragedy. You never said, why me, God? Nah, I didn't have time to. Hmm. Like, if I had the circumstances to where I could have went back and been like, oh, man, like, I didn't have time to. Yeah. Because I came from a place to where if I would have went back home, they just would have been like, ain't good run. <laughs> All right, now go find a gig. Go do something with yourself. Yeah. Right? So I never had the time to feel like, Oh, man, why did this happen to me? And then I was in an environment that I'm so grateful I was in that I was being provided certain resources, but also just a competitor in me. Like to where when my arm was paralyzed, it was like, all right, every single day I got a new contraption that I'm trying out. I got something new that I'm trying to master and do. And so I never had time to kind of, you know, that hit me later. That hit me when I started doing this, you know, and I was at the point to where I felt as if, my life was on the ropes, and I had just moved back to Atlanta, and everything I tried didn't work. What did you try? Like working, tried coaching. Every door I walked into, it was as if the door got closed, right? 
had job offers, would get there, send my resume. Oh, man, you're overqualified. I was trying to work at a rec center in my neighborhood, create leadership curriculums for the kids. Hmm. Everything I tried didn't work until one day I'm talking to one of my buddies. He's like, man, I'm telling you, man, like I'm telling you, you need to speak. Not on no formal stuff. We yeah. just talking, chopping it up. And when I hung up the phone, I remember saying, all right, God, like, like if this it, man, like, let's go. Because at the time, my wife had just had our daughter, Jada. Jada was sleeping in a wagon. Somebody had got her for a birthday. We had put pillows in it. Like, mm. I had nothing at that point. Yeah. Right? And so I was like, all right, cool. And What year I went was out. this? This was, had to be around 2011. Because yeah. I, I want to give people perspective. Yeah, right? 2011. Because we think that it yeah. happens overnight. We think Absolutely. that there's these overnight successes. We think that there's like, there's a real journey behind, you know, what's going on in our lives and what Good people question. see. So this is 2011. Yeah, around 2011. Because yeah. 2010, I had a job offer to go to USC with a coach by the name of Lane Kiffin. And my wife called, shared with me that she was pregnant. And I told him I was going to move back to Atlanta because I wanted to be there when my child was born. Yeah. And he was like, you should. And when I moved back, that's when I thought I was going to work at the rec center in our neighborhood, and it didn't work out. Ended up moving in my wife's grandmother's home. It was also around the time I was finishing up my first book. Had a grandmother that was ill. Wanted to finish that before she passed away. I did. And that's when the speaking journey started. But prior to that, I was in uncharted territory, and I look at it as preparation. Yeah. Right? It was a faith journey, and it still is, but I viewed it as preparation for the season that I was walking into, and it really blessed me, man. Like, I'm thankful that I went through that period of uncertainty because it fortified my faith, mm. right? Like, that's what led to, I tell people often, the Oprah story when I met Oprah, and I got a picture, but when that happened, that moment happened in my life, like... I was about to give up, right? And one morning I got up, my wife was teaching kids. So when you say give up. Yeah, yeah. Like, you not, were... like, not like give up, like just lay down and go in a fetal position, but like, man, like what is this? Yeah. Like I feel like my life is going in reverse. Like my life has never went in reverse. I'm two blocks away from where I grew up. I just came from this neighborhood, got to the height, supposed to be this draft pick, to now you bringing me right back to the neighborhood yeah. I grew up in two blocks away in my wife's grandmother's home. My daughter's sleeping in a wagon. Somebody got her for a birthday. Like my story going south. Yeah. My story was supposed yeah. to be going north. Yeah. And I'm like, God, this don't make sense. And every single morning I'm getting up, trying to go get a job. And one morning I had got my proof for my book back. And my wife was like, all right, Inc, I'm about to go teach these kids. And I was like, meet me in the hallway. And she met me in the hallway. I was like, babe, you're not going to believe it. She said, what you got, Ink? I've been knowing my wife since we were 10, right? And she said, what you got, Ink? I said, I'm about to go take the book to Oprah. My wife's like, Ink, you know Oprah? <laughs> I was like, nope. She's like, you know somebody that know Oprah? I was like, nope. She was like, you sure? I was like, yes, ma'am. She was like, go for it. I went, I packed my truck, 300,000 miles on it, a couple hundred dollars to my name. I get in and I start driving. I get to Chattanooga, call my buddy Jeff. Jeff's an attorney. Jeff pick up. I said, Jeff, you're not going to believe it. I'm about to take the book to Chicago to meet Oprah. Jeff said, Ink, you know Oprah? I was like, no. <laughs> he said, I know what this is. He said, bro, I really admire you. One of the things I really admire about you, extremely ambitious. He said, but the chances of this happening, slim to none. He said, hang up the phone, call me when you get to Knoxville. I called him when I got to Knoxville. He picked up. He said, you're still going, aren't you? I said, absolutely. He said, stop by and pick me up. I'm going to make the ride with you. We get to Chicago that night. Jeff gets us a room. Next morning, we get up. I go to the front desk. I'm asking an elderly lady, can you give me the best directions to Harper? <laughs> lady, I'm telling her, she looking at me like I'm an alien. She, <laughs> she writing on a piece of paper. And she like, good luck, baby. And Jeff is standing in the corner. Jeff was like, ink, wait. He's like, I'm going to get us a taxi. I'm sure this won't be long. And we pull up, and there's people everywhere. And I jump out the car. Jeff says, Ink, I'm going to try to find me something, coffee, something. I'm going to just walk. And I'm just walking the building at the time. And whenever a door would open, I would just run over to it. Say, hey, I'm Inky Johnson. Drove up from Atlanta. 
want to give open my book. They're like, hey, man, like, no, we don't do that. Like, watch out. Like, we don't do that. (laughs) Right? And I remember getting so discouraged. And everybody went into the building. I went across the street. I sat down on the curb. Gentleman comes over. How your day going? I was like, man, I've seen better days. I said, how are you? He said, I'm great. We small talk. He gets up. and He bounces. I look up. Coming down the sidewalk was Oprah and her security guard. I stand up, I said, man, surely her security gonna move me out of the way, but I gotta take my shot. I gotta step Curry this joint. Like, <laughs> I gotta go deep range. I done came too far, right? And I start walking, they keep walking, I keep walking. They stop directly in front of me. Wow. And I said, hey, I'm Inky Johnson. I drove up from Atlanta. I wanna give you my book. And I'll never forget, she grabbed it. She said, thank you, that's nice of you. She handed it to the security. She grabbed my suit, right? I had on a big suit. And she <laughs> shakes it. And she's like, it's a nice suit. Then she's trying to see if I had a gun or a knife or something, <laughs> right? I was like, thank you. And she says, all right, I got to get in. I got to do my show. I said, would you mind if I take a picture with you? She's like, no problem. We take the picture. Um, I go to walk off. Her security, as he's holding the door, I never forget. He said, hey, little man, wait. He said, come here. I got something I want to share with you. And I walked back over to him. He said, I'm not saying anything is going to come of this moment. He said, I'm not saying no TV appearance, no show, no book club. I'm not saying any of that. He said, but usually something like that doesn't happen. Hmm. He said, I just want you to know that doesn't really happen. I said, thank you, man. I greatly appreciate it. I walked off. I put the picture up on social media. I sent it out to family and friends. Everybody's response was, ain't you going to be on the show? (laughs) I said, ain't you going to be on the book club? I was like, I don't know, man. I don't care. I said, what you mean you don't care? I said, that moment wasn't about that for me. They said, what was it about? I said, I needed to know that I was still being guided by a source and by a force that was a lot greater than me. Because for the first time in my life, I felt like God didn't hear me. Hmm. Like even when I was in a two-bedroom home, 14 people, I felt like God heard me. When my career ended, 2000... Six, like, I felt like God heard me. Every time I went to the Mayo Clinic, they stick and die in my back, needles. I got staples. I still felt like God heard me. Hmm. And so it was always this optimism like, oh, man, God got me. I'm good. And for the first time in my life, when I moved back to Atlanta, my daughter sleeping in a wagon, and I had nothing. I felt like God didn't hear me. Hmm. And I was like, God, like this ain't going the way I thought it would go, man. Yeah. And so when that encounter happened, people always ask me, what came of that? I say, nothing came of it, but everything came of it. It was your faith. It fortified my faith, yes. right? That's yes. what speaking is. Yes. It yes. changed the game for me. And yes. so for me, when I went back to Atlanta, it was all about obedience then. It's all about obedience now, right? When I went back, I was like, God, you got me. Use yeah. me. I'm going to be obedient to what I feel you're calling me to do with my life. And that's when speaking started for me. Wow. Yeah, that's when it started. I mean, literally, I have gotten chills listening to you. Like, I mean, tearing up. Thank you. And because you totally understand the power of faith. And you you don't know faith until you're confronted with it like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You don't know it. Until you got to live it. Yeah. Yeah, And I think that that's been the real testament of your life is living out and through the adversity, you know, and creating an opportunity in the midst of the adversity. Absolutely. You know, you talk a lot about the pain of regret, Mm -hmm. the pain of regret. And what do you say? The pain of regret is far heavier than the price of discipline. Absolutely. And so yeah. you just choosing not to walk in the pain of the regret. Yeah, absolutely. Because I feel like, um, and I've been this type of person before, I feel like as people, we're often arrogant. Like we feel as if life has promised us something, hmm. right? The way we live, the way we speak about life, the way we approach things, the way we treat people, like we're often arrogant, right? To where one of the reasons I'm grateful for my injury is because it showed me the fragility of life. Yeah. It showed me how quickly things can change. Very early on, too. Right? Very early, 20, 20 years 20, old. Yeah. Right? It showed me how quick. I'm talking about 
You got the world in front of you, so-called world, right, in front of you. And then you go to sleep and you wake up and your life is totally different, right? I look in the mirror, my appearance was totally different, right? From that point moving forward, everything was totally different. Yeah. And so it showed me the fragility of life. And so when I speak to, you know, just the pain of regret, the price of discipline, I firmly believe when you give everything you got to something, right? I'm talking about blood, sweat, and tears, everything you got to something, right? The peace in that is not the result or the reward. The peace is the fact that I gave everything I had to yeah. it because this is who I am. Yeah. yeah. So now, even if it doesn't turn out the way I want it to, yeah. I didn't go to the NFL. Yeah. That was a dream I had since I was seven. It didn't happen. But it was a certain level of peace that resided inside of me because I knew September 9th, 2006, my last tackle, I can honestly say with every fiber of my being, I gave everything I had to. It. Yeah. And so if God said, ink this your time, we done with it. All right, cool. What's next? Yeah. But the pain and regret would be if I went to make that tackle, didn't give everything I had to it. I get injured. Life has changed. And now I got to carry a burden of, man, what if I gave what everything I, I had to yeah. it? Because people are amazing, man. Like, people are talented, skillful, brilliant. Like, people are so gifted. Yeah. Right? But people very seldom give everything they got to something. And so they walk around with regret. They walk around with bitterness. They walk around with all these different things when things don't turn out the way that they want it to because they didn't give everything they had to it. And it's like, bro, the price of discipline, pain and regret. Like, just be disciplined and go at it. Yeah. If it doesn't turn out, the reward is you got peace. Yeah. That you gave everything you had to it, right? It's not about the outcome. But I think that the hardest part, and I think for so many young people, and you're at this age and stage, you're not even 40 years old yet, right? Right. So you're at this age where, you know, as a 20-something-year-old learning that. Mm -hmm. But the average 20-something ain't trying to hear that because right. yeah. they're not looking at life from that yeah. vantage point. Right. You know, they was like, YOLO, like, no let's get let's it. Do like, it. Let's I'm trying to get it. it how I live, no right? Question. And so what is that one thing that you could teach mm -hmm. that 20-something, you yeah. know, or even that 30-something mm -hmm. that says, you know what? I'm just trying to, I'm trying to get to it. And, it, yeah. you know, if it happened to happen, if it don't, it don't. Or what, what piece of advice can you give to that person to even yeah. help them walk in that level of discipline yeah. and that, that level of gratitude? Yeah. I remember an elder said something to me because, you know, I was that at 20, 21. You young, you feel invincible. Yeah. Right? You feel can't nothing stop you. You gifted, you talented, you skillful, you brilliant. And I remember an elder said to me one day, Always be willing to challenge and reevaluate what you think you know to be true, right? And I'm like, okay, I'm picking up what you're putting down, <laughs> right? I got you. He's like, no, nah, always be willing to challenge and reevaluate what you think you know to be true. And as I got older, what I started to understand was, in terms of an athlete, you could say it to an athlete this way, don't become a victim of your own talent. Mm. You could be so skillful, so gifted, so talented. You could be the cat that can roll out of bed, do something that not a lot of other people can do. Yeah. But sooner than later, it's going to catch up with you. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like, yeah. that's the trick of life, yeah. right? You YOLO, you living, yeah. you good. People tell you, oh, do your thing, right? You yeah. got skill sets, you got gifts, you got talents and abilities that can help you get out of problems, help you overcome adversity and opposition. But the trick of life is, if you're not growing with your gifts, your talent, and your ability, sooner or later, your advantage is going to become your disadvantage. Yeah. Right? And if you're not skillful enough, if you're not resilient enough, it could be fatal. Yeah. So I'm not telling you not to enjoy it. Yeah. Enjoy it. Yeah. Live it up. You should. It's a gift. Yeah. It's beautiful. But always understand on the other side of that, it has to be a certain level of gratitude because life is fleeting. Yeah. Right? Life is short. Even in this totality, life is short. And so for me, when I speak to young people, it's always like, man, give everything you got. Live it up. Yeah. But always understand it should be a level of gratitude because even us, we woke up today blessed, grateful, but somebody that woke up today, they're not going to live to see the night. Yeah, yeah. Like, the blessing for me, Brandy, one of my first times going up to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, you see everything at the Mayo Clinic. And I'm up there and I'm like, man, I'm, I'm over going to doctor's visits. Hmm. I'm about to go up here, get these long needles stuck in my back, and I'm sitting in there and 
I look across from me, and it's a little girl, like my daughter's age now, my daughter 13. And it's two adults sitting on the side of her, and they holding something up on her face. I don't even know the condition. And it's like both of them are holding stuff up on her face, and I'm like, like I just got her arm, hmm. right? But the challenge is, when I speak to the arrogance of people, we all feel as if, oh man, it ain't gonna happen, happen to, me. to me. It can't happen to me. Right? And you don't yeah. want it to happen yeah. to anybody. Yeah. You know, I, like, yeah. I don't wish something like this yeah. on anybody. Yeah. Right? But we all face adversity, opposition, trauma, and challenges in different ways. Right? Yeah. And so all I'm saying is just be prepared. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, just be prepared. Yeah. Mentally, just be prepared. Yeah. Spiritually, just be prepared. Yeah. Right? That when your time comes, when your number is called, and something is present on your front door, you skilled enough, you tooled up, and you can deal with it. Yeah. Just be prepared. Right? And so, yeah, I get it. I was 20, 21. I felt, I felt <laughs> I mean, the same way. It, it, it is. I mean, and even sometimes, even at 40, you know, no you question. still feel like, that ain't going to happen. Like, yeah. I'm good, you yeah. know? But even with your level of preparation, and I think that that speaks to your skill as a speaker and what yeah. you've been able to do. And you talk about how you prepare for your messages and how you'll get on multiple conference calls to be able to lean into what that organization needs and what they're looking for, what they're, what they're wanting from you as a speaker, you know? Yeah. And that level of preparation has played very well for you in your career. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, I think preparation shows respect. It totally does. You, know? you said it's the X factor, but Absolutely. it is. It totally Absolutely. is the X factor. I think it shows respect and honor for the people, the organizations, the teams, whoever you're dealing with. Yeah. Right. I think it shows a certain level of respect that you were diligent enough and you took time for the people that you're dealing with to go and look up not only what you want to say to them, but what's important to them. Yeah. Right, that bleeds over into every area of life. Yeah. It's like when I talk to my wife, when I talk to my children, when I talk to my three little sisters, when I listen to my parents, right? But just being prepared enough to where, like, I could look at my children and say, I'm their elder, right? Because of my age. But oftentimes, my children can be dealing with a situation or a circumstance and they can be the elder in the moment. Yeah. Based upon what they're dealing with and what they're going through, I can approach it and say, I'm older than you. This is how you deal with it. <laughs> right? And they can say something to me and have a totally different perspective yeah. that I wasn't even thinking about. Right? And so I think preparation shows a totally different level of respect and honor for the people that you're dealing with. And so for me and my career, that's what I base my career off of. I'm coming up on, you know, a crazy number of years doing this. Yeah. And I think the thing that sustained me was my preparation. Yeah. You know, early in my career, it was, man, I can't wait to hit the stage and speak, you know, energy, this, that, and the third. Now, like you spoke to, I do several conference calls. I read books sometimes that companies send yeah. out. Yeah. Right? I get notes that they send out. I meet with people. And it's all based upon the premise of respect. Yeah. Right? If you respect me enough to give me an opportunity, I'm going to respect you enough to go and do my research Absolutely. so when I come, I can be effective and efficient with what I'm putting Absolutely. down. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's just really the key to life, you know. But you mentioned your parents, right? Absolutely. And you mentioned your, you've talked a lot about your father and him not being as present right. when you were a child, mm -hmm. but how that changed as you all have gotten older and Absolutely. he's become more of a friend to you. Yeah. How has that really transformed, you know, the things that you've had to unlearn about him yeah. and the, un the things that you've had to unlearn or unbecome mm. in this season of your life as a father yourself? I'm so, I'm so grateful um, for my father. I'm so grateful for my mother. And um, it's like you don't understand certain things until you become a parent, mm. right? Like as a kid, you could become very judgmental. You could see things a certain yeah. way. And it's cool and it's valid, Yeah. right? Because that's the way you feel in the moment. 
And so you honor your truth, right? But once you get in that situation and you have children, you have a spouse, yeah. you have to do some of those things, you have to go down some of those same roads, you look at it totally different. Like I remember calling uh, my mother and my father one day just saying, man, thank y'all. Yeah. Like, thank y'all for the things that y'all did for me. Even the fact that me and my father started off a little rocky. And now that's that's my man, 50 grand. That's my man. Yeah. Right? Watching him as a grandfather, even watching him as a father, you know, to my two little sisters and just our relationship now. But I really saw a side of my father, you know, Brandy, like, People often think when I speak to my injury, when I say I'm grateful for it, that it revolves around the game mm. or something that's happened in speaking. Yeah. It's not that. Like it showed me several sides of different people that I didn't get to witness prior to the injury. Like the side of my father that I got to witness in the midst of the adversity, I had never seen this version of my father. That was the first time I saw that version of my father. What did that version look like? That said, I'm dropping everything, man. I'm gonna just be here with my son, mm. right? He in the house washing my clothes, right? My body got staples in it. He going to the store getting plastic bags. Him and my roommates cutting them because I got so many incisions on my body. Mm. I couldn't get wet. He making sure my shoes were tied. Like I had never saw that version of my father. And so even when you say like, ain't you ain't have time to be like, I didn't. Right, because I'm a very aware person, right? I'm a very like observant person. So when this was happening and transpiring, I was like, wow, man, I've never been blessed with my father in this form. Yeah. And he stayed with me for almost a month. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was I was extremely grateful for it. And now watching him with our kids, like me and my wife's kids, it's phenomenal. Yeah. Right? But it's made me get to a place to where it's like you have to always be willing to extend a level of grace, right? Like my guy Oak asked me a question one day. He said, um, how would you respond if your kids treated you the way you treated your father when you was young? Was this on the podcast episode? Because I yeah. feel like I listened to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I feel like he I said, listened to the episode, yeah. yeah. He said, how would you respond yeah if your kids treated you the way you treated your father at yeah. certain times when you was young. Yeah. Because there were certain times in my life when I was young, my father hit me up, hey, Ink, I'm trying to come through. I'm like, yeah, I'm uh, cool on that. Yeah. Right? I said, I don't know if I would have probably been able to deal with something like that. He said, and he still showed up for you, bro. Not to say that everything was right. He still showed up. In the face of opposition, adversity, challenges, your father still was there. Yeah. Meeting resistance, meeting adversity, getting treated a certain way. He still showed up. And so it shows you what you consider to be one version of a man. When you become a father and a certain version of a man, it makes you have a certain level of respect for this man to the 10th yeah. power. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because at one stage and phase when you were young, your perspective didn't have the capacity to understand who he was. Yeah, and the decisions and why they made the decisions that they Absolutely. made. Absolutely. I mean, that you know, I remember being in college um, in my freshman year, I had to write this paper. Hmm. And uh, freshman year, I wrote this paper and I'm standing in my professor's office hours and she said to me, it's amazing when we finally understand that our parents are human. Mm. Mm. It's amazing when we finally understand that our parents are human. Mm. And you, it takes you to get to a certain age and stage of your life Absolutely. to see the humanness Absolutely. of your parents. And Absolutely. so in that humanness, because your mom was working very hard, double mm -hmm. shifts at Wendy's to make sure that you were living the dream that you Absolutely. wanted to live and your father, how has that been, you know, learning to extend grace to people amidst adversity because you you've had to some things have been challenged for you yeah. because of your injury Absolutely. you had to relearn you had to learn how to write with your left hand mm -hmm. you had to learn how to tie your shoe that that could be very frustrating to Absolutely. a person 
Absolutely. That could send you through so many things. Absolutely. And so the amount of grace that you got to give yourself in those moments, but then other people, because they are yeah. giving you the best that they got. Absolutely. You know, how hard yeah. is that? It was, it was extremely tough um, in the early phases because, like you said, it was, it, was, um, it was frustrating. Yeah. You know, I would go out, somebody would just look and stare at my arm. Like, then when I would look, they will turn off. And they'll look again. And it took me doing some work, right? Like some real inner work to get to the space and place to where when I would be out and I would catch somebody looking, I'll be like, hey, bro, it's all good. You want to know what, what happened? Because I know people have you got to stop saying? you now. You know, yeah. They, you know I know they kind of, I know Absolutely. kids probably be like, because oh, you know, if my no nephew was here, he'd kids. be like, what? Oh, Let you know, me see your no, arm. Ain't no feelings <laughs> on them kids, right? <laughs> Them kids, cause they gonna grab. What's this? What's going on? That would be my what nephew. you got going on? You know what I'm saying? That's the beauty of life, yeah. man. But it took me some work, but also my kids. Mm. You know, I um. But they've never known another version of you, right? But also, we had never really talked in depth about it either. Mm. So they could see a video, they could hear somebody talk. But me and them hadn't had that dialogue until one day um, my daughter Jada, she got in the car just real random. Just get in the car after I pick her up from cheer practice, like real random. Like I don't know if something, if somebody asked her questions yeah. at practice yeah. and she couldn't answer them or what. She just got in the car, pick up, like, what up, Jay? How you practice? Oh, it's good, Dad. So, Dad, um, when you wear that sleeve, she just started hitting me with questions. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. And in the midst of them, I realized, like, oh, man, me and Jay never had this talk before. I've never and had to share that I've part. I've never shared this with my wow, daughter before. Wow, wow. Like, yeah. I've never, like, I just assume, like. They just know. Knows. Yeah. But I had never shared that with her. Yeah. And so even in the midst of me sharing it with my own kids and them navigating through it, and I kind of let them work through it as they work through it, because I know that's the beautiful thing about adversity and opposition. I believe when you live with it, it teaches you, right? As you grow older, it teaches you, not only about yourself, about others. And so even with my own children, watching them grow and have different questions just based upon the phase that they're in in life, I let them navigate and get yeah. to it. And at certain times, my son Inc. will come up and he'll have certain questions and we'll deep dive. Certain times, Jada will come up She'll have questions, we'll deep dive. And that's helped me out a lot, you know, especially when you get around kids, you know, because their perspective, it is what it is and it's beautiful. But also with adults, just being open and being willing to share and extend that level of grace and not take it as an attack, right? Not take it as, oh man, why are they just looking at me like that? Yeah. Because in the early stages, that's how I felt yeah, about it. Yeah, I can right? imagine. You didn't want to really go out to the mall, you didn't want to go out to Walmart or whatever, you didn't want to go out because every time you go out, somebody will look at you, but they didn't say anything. And so now when I go out, the grace in it for me is, all right, man, if somebody is looking, bro, you good, all good, no pressure. Let me tell you about it, what happened? Or somebody will come up and be like, ain't keep it a buck with me. Yeah. You said you wouldn't change it, right? And I'm like, I wouldn't, you know? And so now I'm in a space and place to where it's all predicated upon grace with me. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a daily activity that's extremely difficult for you? Every day I run into something that I can't do that I used to be able to do. Like what? So even with my son, if we go out and play ball and we could be doing something and something I used to be able to do, naturally I'll try to do it because of the athlete in me. And then I'll have to figure out a different way to navigate and do it. But just even when I wake up, Right, like I have to get up earlier than everybody else, not only for my process, because just naturally I'm doing stuff with one hand, one mm. arm. And so naturally it's gonna take longer. me a lot longer to do it than the rest of the crib. And so for me, every single day, and that used to be extremely frustrating. Yeah. You know, in the early stages when I would encounter something, you know, very early on, because very early on when it happened, just naturally, you weren't used to living without one of your limbs. And so naturally, you would just encounter things that you used to be able to do, 
that you couldn't do. And you were right-handed. Yeah, I was right-hand dominant. Yeah. Yeah, I was yeah. right-hand dominant. And so, but it's always it's always a blessing on the other side of it. You know, the perspective that it instills. Yeah. So your your friend Oak, yeah, he yeah. is your podcast co-host. Um that's and he was your eighth grade teacher. Yeah, that's my And guy. he said that he pointed to your wife one day and said, you're going to marry that girl mm-hmm. when y'all were in eighth grade. Yep. How has relationship and marriage been with a paralyzed arm? Yeah. Because I think people want to know that. No like, question. I feel no like that's, that's, that's something that piques some interest. Mm-hmm. Because how old were you guys when you got married? We were 25. Okay, yeah, so yeah. you've you've gotten over the the ten year hump yeah, of marriage. Absolutely, you've been married over ten years. Yeah. And so, what was that? Was it like you were so familiar with her, and you just felt like a natural love and connection, and mm-hmm. that was how that sparked? And but what's yeah. been what's it been like? Man, um, it's been very fulfilling, um, very rewarding. I'm glad I met my wife at the age that I met her. Mm. You know, I met my wife. We were kids at the park, grew up, same neighborhood, Kirkwood, Zone 6, (laughs) you know, East Atlanta, (laughs) you know. And uh, I know my wife, Mm. you know. My wife knows me. Like, my wife know my mom. I know my wife's grandmother. Yeah. Right, know my wife's sister. My wife know my three little sisters. And so even with uh, my injury and living with a paralyzed right arm and hand, um, my wife knows ink pre-injury. And so she knows the spirit, she knows the mindset, she knows the attitude, she knows the thought process. Yeah. Like she knows me. And so for me, it's been extremely rewarding just having somebody that I know has my back, Mm. you know, like, when I think about things that come to mind about my wife, man, um, like not only life partner, like I know my wife gonna hold me down. Yeah. Like, and when I say hold me down, not hold me down, like I know my wife got me, got yeah. me. Like, yeah. speak things into me, mm-hmm. right? Call things out of me. Like, I know she knows me. She knows the little kid that was running around, 2X t shirt, dirty, <laughs> nappy head, scars on his face. Like, she knows me. Yeah. And so to be able to wake up every single day in the house with somebody that knows you and really cares for you and to build a life with that person, I feel extremely grateful for my wife. Yeah. Like, extremely grateful for my wife. But Oak called it. He called it in the eighth grade. He scared, eighth grade. He scared me, though. You know, <laughs> but he called it. He yeah. was prophesying. He was prophesying. He was speaking it. He was yeah. speaking. He was speaking it. What has yeah. marriage taught you about yourself? Mm-hmm how much I didn't know that mm. I thought I did. Like what? Um, I remember early in my marriage um, calling one of my friends um, that had been married for a while at this point, older than me, and I'm frustrated, right? Me and my <laughs> wife, we trying to figure it out. Yeah. This when we getting, yeah. we moving in together. We trying to figure life out, yeah. right? I call him, like, man, like, I don't like how she doing this, man. I don't like how she doing this. Like, I don't like how she doing this. And he listened to me, yeah. right? And when I stopped, he said, uh, you know, if I was to call your wife right now, she'd have a list twice as long, don't you? <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, man, God didn't give you your wife, man, for you to change your wife. Mm-hmm. It's like, man, this ain't sports. Like, this ain't ball. Like, God didn't bless you with your wife for you to change your wife. God bless you with your wife for you to love your wife. Mm-hmm. For y'all to work through problems together. This ain't about, oh, she ain't doing this. She... No, nah, it ain't about that. Mm-hmm. Right? And so for me, it was about going on a journey of just understanding mm-hmm. how to love my wife, not loving the version of my wife that fits me. Oh, that's good. But how to love my wife. Yeah. Oftentimes we love and we appreciate the version of people that suits us. Yeah. Right? And so for me, it was about figuring out how to love my wife. Like, what really makes you happy? Right, what brings you peace? Right, the things that I do, the things I say, how I operate, how I treat our children. And so for me, marriage has been one of the greatest tools of my growth every single day. 
you know, just in terms of just the school of marriage, right? Learning how to navigate life with my wife, right? Learning how to be humble enough that when I'm not operating <laughs> on a level that I feel yeah. like I'm capable of operating, I can suppress my ego and say, all right, babe, I'm cool. Like, how can we work through it, right? Knowing that when she asks certain things of me, she's not attacking me. She just wants me to get better, yeah. right? And so for me, um, one of my challenges early on in my marriage and in my life, I would just cut people off, mm. right? Like, no one and no nothing. Like, if I felt so like- So just some, block folks. I'm not even block. Like, I'm, I'm just not finna talk to you for the rest of life. Cut off right? game strong. Yeah, cut off game strong. I'm yeah. out of here. Right, when I felt like people was, like, I always felt like if you're an adult, you know what you're doing. Mm. Like children, I probably, hey, hey, young, young fella, let me pull you <laughs> to the side, man. Let me, let me put you on game. You might not know what's going on right now. But adults, I always yeah. felt like adults know what they're doing, right? Yeah. So I ain't finna go through no thesis with you. Yeah. I ain't finna, right? And so I remember my wife saying to me one day, like, you know, you got a lot of people that you might need to pick up the phone and call them. I was like, what you mean by Your that? Your wife says it. Yeah, I was like, what you mean by that? <laughs> she was like, you just be cutting people off. Like, if something happened and you ain't really, just to cut people off. How you know somebody wasn't going through something? Yeah. Like, how you know they weren't dealing with something? Yeah. And you just uh, cut them off and bounce. And I was like, all right, what up, man? I got you. I wasn't really trying to hear it. I wasn't <laughs> feeling it. And when I got by myself, I thought about it. And I really started to kind of deal with it. And I was like, man, where does that spirit come from? Mm. Like, what's the foundation? Where did it originate at? Mm. And I was like, man, that's the same spirit I had when I was a boy. Mm. And I had to figure out how to navigate life without my father. Mm. And so the easiest way to navigate and deal with it was I just cut it off. Yeah. Like, he ain't coming. Yeah. Like, I ain't gonna be there. I just cut it off so I can navigate. Yeah, it's self preservation. Yeah. That's it. So, so I, I can, can navigate. protect myself. Right. And so yeah. now, in this season of my life, when my wife called that out, it was like, yeah, you do need to deal with that better. How long ago was that? Five years? Mm hmm. Uh, yeah. Five years. Early yeah. 30s. But, ugh, listen. Early 30s. Early 30s. I tell yeah. people all the time, like, 35, but if if you ain't got 35 yet, you know, yeah. and, and I, my grandmama used to always say, just keep living. Just and you keep know, living. Every time my grandmama keep would living. say, keep living, I'd be like, oh, here she go keep again. Living. Like, girl, like, we know you old. Like, we get it. <laughs> you know? Keep living. But now, over 40, yeah. you like, keep living. Keep living. Keep living. No question. Baby, them perspectives is going to change. Coming. We be so staunch, like, so matter of fact in yeah. your early 30s you know like the 20s and 30s you are so you know it all and it's my way and I know it and I've been da, da, da. Yeah. and listen 35 I feel like there's this like shift that just happens no question like there's like this upheaval in your life and like yeah. the metamorphosis starts no question. and then by the time you get to 40 you're like yeah who keep oh, living you listen yeah. keep living keep living keep living yeah so yeah. what is this season teaching you? Because you talk um, very heavily about this unbecoming. Mm -hmm. Like, what's more important? What you acquire or who you become? Mm -hmm. Unbecoming. So you have to unbecome some things and you're evolving. What, mm -hmm. is, what are you unlearning? What are you challenging right now in your life? I'm in a season... Um, I'm in a season of my life of... Uh, obedience right that's your word of the day that's it man because i'm really pressing it and i'm gonna tell you why and so uh like i feel like you know like when god puts certain things on your spirit like sure you felt it before like the people in the room have felt it like god put some on my spirit um it was a while ago man and what he placed on my spirit what god placed on my spirit was Check on your friends, and, man, I'm going to get emotional. It's okay. Man. God said, um, check on your friends and their marriages. Mm. 
and their children. And I was like, I was like, nah. I was like, nah, God, I'm good. I was like, nah. I was like, um, I was like, man, like, I ain't intruding on nobody's marriage. Yeah. I was like, I ain't doing that. God kept putting on my spirit. I'll be working out. I'll be doing stuff. I was like, I was like, nah, I'm good, man. I ain't doing that. And God kept placing it on my spirit, kept placing it on my spirit. And uh, one day, uh, one of my friends hit me up. Dang. And he was like, God. Oh. Okay. He was like, God. Uh, he was like, ink. Man, I'm about to go through a divorce. Mm. And uh, if I could be real with y'all, I was like, damn. I was like, damn. You know, to myself, I was like, damn. Man. I wasn't obedient. Until mm. when God told me to check on him. Now, that to me that doesn't mean that I could have prevented it. Yeah. Right? Because everybody go through what they go through. Yeah. And deal with it how they deal with it. But I felt like as a brother, as a friend, you know, to his children, I felt like I let him down. Mm. You know, that I didn't. I didn't move when God, like God placed that on my spirit specifically. And I was like, yeah. man, people grown, man. Like, I ain't, I don't want nobody. I don't even know how to do that. Like, that's that was my answer. And uh, when he called me and told me, I wrestled with it. Not that I could have prevented it because, you know, they grown. They going through their marriage. But it was more so the fact that I wasn't obedient to what God told me to do. Yeah. And that was to check on my brothers in their marriages. And, you know, when I looked at his children, I looked at his spouse, I looked at him, I was just like, damn, man. You know, because I, I feel like... Um, the world, you know, and children, when children have to navigate the world, man, and sometimes when that father is not in the home. Oh, listen. <laughs> it's a different experience. It's very different. It's very different. And uh, And so for me, I'm in a season of my life to where I'm being obedient. Obedience above everything else. To what God is calling me to do in my life, you know, specifically with my brothers, their spouses, their children. I ain't trying to tell nobody what to do, yeah. but it's just the fact that just checking on them, yeah. you know, it was more so the disappointment that when he called me, he was already at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And if I would have been obedient, we probably could have had some dialogues prior to that. Yeah. That who's to say? Yeah. But more so as a brother, as a friend. Like I know in life, somebody asked that question, you're supposed to be on, oh man, I'm writing this book, I'm doing this. But <laughs> no. like yeah. I'm in a season of obedience. Mm. Right? Because when I look at my brother, I look at his children. I look at his spouse, 
the type of friend that I am, mm-hmm. the type of brother that I am, it bothers me. Yeah. You know? And so... I mean, but there are so many yeah. moments, right? And we look back at our lives and we're like, God, if I would have just listened to that voice, right? Question. The God voice, you know? Yeah. And even as you're talking, um, my first love of my life, first love of my life, 17 years old, you know, all in love, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, this was, it was right before we turned 35. And... His birthday is September 19th. And all day, Holy Spirit said, call him. Call yeah. him and wish him a happy birthday. I'm like, I ain't talked to that Negro in like, <laughs> girl, I ain't talked to him in like two, three years. Like, I see him. I, I call when I get home to Cleveland Thanksgiving mm-hmm. and tell him I'm in town and see okay. what's up. Come by the house. Ten days later, his our homeboy called. As soon as his name popped up on the phone, I said, mm. Mm-mm, he's gone. Mm. And I knew it. And I knew it. And I remember I was avoiding the call. My sister's calling me because it's on Facebook now. Mm. And she's like, Brandy, I- I'm seeing something on Facebook and I just can't believe it. And I'm like, it's true. And in that moment, I was like, 10 days ago, mm. you got to knock at the door to be obedient. And I asked you, just go ahead, just check on him. Say hey. Yeah. I'm mean, giving you a little bit more peace and a little more comfort, right? But it doesn't change what no happened. Question. But no we question. do, I think obedience is such a great place to be in this season. Yeah. And, you know, each year I do a word for yeah. the year, right? Mm-hmm. And 20, I think 2019, my year was, that year was obedience. Mm. To just be obedient. That was the year my book came out, all the things, right? And life just really opens up when we're obedient. No question. God God reveals to us things that we never even imagined or dreamed of yeah. when we just stay on the path that he has designed for us and say, not my will, but thy will be done. No question. Yeah. The good book says it, man. It says obedience is better than sacrifice. Yeah. But we judge the level of sacrifice without first being obedient. One of my boys told me something, man, and it was so, it was so strong, you know, just about trusting and being obedient. He said, um, "Ink always, um, always be on the lookout for God's echo." <laughs> he said, "Always be on the lookout for God's echo." Yeah. And he said, "When you feel something, when people say things, and it's interconnected in different ways." Like something you want to do, something you're trying to do, something you need to do. Yeah. And it just shows up yeah. in different ways. He said, that's God's echo, man. You know, always be on the lookout for God's echo. Yeah. And have the faith to trust it. Yeah. You know? How hard is that at yeah. times? Extremely. Because other people's voices can get really loud <laughs> and they can just drown out. <laughs> God's voice. God's <laughs> voice becomes so faint. Uh, no question. No question. <laughs> you know, how has that happened for you in your life? Yeah, it's extremely tough. You know, that's why, you know, I got emotional. Yeah. You know, just about that incident. It's extremely tough because you convince yourself of certain things, right? When you don't want to do something, you know? And so when it comes to trusting, when it comes to being obedient, it could be extremely tough. You know, to the point to where you have to have a certain level of faith to trust it. Yeah. And to be okay with whatever the outcome is. Right. And so for me, um, one of the reasons I didn't trust it is because I convinced myself that, man, I don't want to intrude yeah. on nobody. Yeah. Like, people grown. Yeah. Right. And yeah. like with me and my family, we got a we got a little term, M Y O B. Right, in my in my kids walk through the door right now. You say Ink J M Y O B. They gonna M-Y-O-B. say mind your own business. M Y O B. M Y O B. Mind your own business, right? <laughs> and so for me, I've um, I've often convinced myself of that, you know. Mm-hmm. And so when that happened, I felt several different things. Like I said, I couldn't have probably changed it because that's their situation. It was the fact that I didn't trust the voice. Oof. That I didn't trust the I didn't yeah. trust it, and 
So it's extremely difficult. Yeah. You know, it's extremely difficult. And that's the faith, right? Yeah. We're trusting even when we can't see it. Absolutely. That's that's all faith is. Yeah. I'm trusting even though I cannot see it. No doubt. And that's how God's echo can get drowned out in so many of our lives because I don't see it. I don't trust it. Mm. But the faith part is I'm trusting and I don't see it. Mm. I'm trusting in the echo yeah. that only I can hear. You better preach, girl. You better <laughs> preach. <laughs> Listen, you are just, you have so, like, it's one thing to experience you online. It's one thing to experience you online, right? Mm. But there's another thing to experience you in person, you know, and the God that is on your life. Thank you. You are such a demonstrator. And I'm a firm believer that God is the ultimate receipt giver, right? Mm. God got receipts. No you doubt. You know what I'm saying? Like, he got all the car facts. You know no what I'm doubt. saying? Like, got it, run it. You know, run the play. <laughs> you know? But the thing about it is we've just really been called to be demonstrators. Mm. Like of God that. on the earth, right? Like that. And you are such a demonstrator. Thank you, you are such a demonstrator. And it has nothing to do with just, you know, with, oh, well, he had an injury. So, right. yeah, he's a demonstrator. No, I think the level of faith that you exude, the level of intuitiveness, the discernment of God, like, I think that that is so powerful. And it's all on you. Thank it's you. really all on you. Thank you. Yeah, it's all on you. Yeah, I didn't want to have a regular, you know, <laughs> interview with you. Nah, but you didn't you didn't took me there. You had Barbara Walter moment, you know, you didn't cry uh, a little bit. You took me there. You got Listen. me talking about something <laughs> I ain't supposed to talk about. Listen, everybody you who comes that sit, out of me. sit in the seat says the same thing. They said, you got me saying stuff I never said yeah. before. Yeah. And that's a beautiful place because here's, the, I think, the unbecoming that you are in in this season and the evolution of you Absolutely. is... To challenge the story that you've even been telling. No question. Yeah. No question. To challenge that story. Yeah. Absolutely. So what's the new story that Inky yeah. Johnson is writing in yeah. this season? What are you committed to outside of obedience yeah. and trust in the echo? Um, everything I do, everything I'm connected to, um, everything I'm privileged to, you know, be a part of. I try my best to think about my my wife. I try my best to think about my children. I try my best to think about my mother, my father, my three little sisters. Um, I think one of the most powerful gifts that I could give to my children is a good last name. Hmm. I'm proud of the way that I've done business. Yeah. Like, I'm proud of the way I've done it. Like, I'm proud of the way I've made money. I'm proud of the way I've done it. Like I'm proud of the way that I've treated people yeah. along the way. Yeah. Right? Before yeah. anybody knew yeah. me, yeah. now that a couple of people know me, like I'm proud of the way that I've treated people. Like to the point to where for me, like um, when it's all said and done, man, when the clock stops, when we fold up tent. I just want people to say, man, that was a good dude. Yeah, man. yeah, yeah. That was a good yeah, dude, man. Yeah. Like, that yeah. was a solid cat. Yeah, man. yeah. You know, like, I take my title as husband, father, son, big brother over all the accolades that I've accomplished. I love that because there's a book that talks about, like, some people live for the resume and other people live for the obituary, mm. right? Yeah. So some are just listen, living for the accolades, for the yeah. things that they can acquire. And you talk about that Absolutely. a lot. But to live in a way of what they will say about you when you're no longer able to be in any room. Absolutely. You know, that's a real, yeah. that's living with a whole different level of integrity. No question. That's living with a whole different level of faith. Absolutely. Obedience. Absolutely. Because even what you just said, like, you take your title of husband, of father, of big brother, of son yeah. very seriously. Absolutely. And I don't think a lot of people think about those titles as much as they think about the titles of chief executive officer yeah. or senior vice president or, yeah. you know, chief yeah. content 
creator. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, Cats and you're have thinking all type of, of titles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember I was doing an event and they was like, "Hey, you want us to introduce you?" Like, I was like, "Husband, father, whatever." Speak. It's like that's it. I'm like, that's it. <laughs> that's a lot. Like that's it. I'm like, that's it. Like, Listen. no, you saying is that it? I'm saying like, that's it. I mean, you like, know what? That's the play. Inky, that is the reason why when people come on the show, I'm always like, wife, mother, yep. husband, yep. father, baby, that yeah. that's a that's, that's a, the play. that's the prime time role. That's the play. Because I Listen. think about it like this. Like, what if uh, you do all this great stuff? You crush it. Like, I'm talking about you flat out crush it. You go out, man, you make your money, you do your thing. Yeah. Business, you do it. Can't nobody hold a candle. Talking about you that guy, you that one, like you, you got it. And you get toward the latter years and somebody say to your son or your daughter, what you, he whack. That yeah. ain't the dude we know. Yeah. A public success and a private failure. We don't know him. Yeah. Yeah. Like, the dude y'all speaking about, we ain't never seen him like that. We don't know him. Right? And so my mother told me at a very young age, we were riding in an old beat-up Buick Regal, hubcaps off the car, seats torn up. My mother said, son, the worst thing you could ever do as a young man and as a man is look in that mirror and lie to yourself. Hmm. She said, Ink, you live with your truth. Whatever it is, good, bad, and you live with it. Yeah. Like, don't lie to yourself. And so for me, like, man, it's about representation. It's about doing things the right way. It's about one day when your kid's walking on this green earth, not saying that you could protect them. I ain't trying to protect them for nothing. I want yeah. them to be prepared. But I want when somebody speak to my children about me, they can be proud of the man yeah. that I am. Yeah. And they can say, man, like, yeah, I know him. Yeah. I know that dude. Yeah. Like, dude y'all talking about? We know him. I know him. I see him at the crib every day. <laughs> I saw he treated my, yeah. my mom. Yeah. Like, that's my dude. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so always being cognizant of that. Yeah. Like, yeah. That is amazing. You, I think you are just, you are in a class all by yourself. You are Thank really you. in a class all by yourself. So as we close out this interview, mm. what is Inky Johnson making space for right now? Inky Johnson is making space to be effective and efficient in the second half of my children's childhood. So as they're going into high school in a few years, mm. um, when they were young, my plan was to run really hard just in speaking, build up my clientele, um, speak a lot, you know, build my career. And now that they're getting a lot older, um, being more present, yeah, you know, like I am now, being more selective, doing more things, using my talents, my skill sets in a lot of different ways, uh, just so I could be there as they're getting older because the dialogue is changing. Yeah. You know, the questions that they had at five and six. <laughs> now when they get, when they get 15, 16, like, Pop's going to need to be there. Yeah. Right? And so for me, just making space and room, first and foremost, for my family, but also making room for my gifts mm. that I can express them in a different way. Like, I feel as if the world hasn't seen some of the things that reside on the inside of me. I liken it to when I got injured and I started speaking. And people was like, man, I ain't, I ain't, I didn't know either. But when people yeah. were like, man, I didn't know that dude could speak like that. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> but now, the amount of years that I've been doing it, I have something inside of me that the world hasn't seen yet. Oh, yeah. And I know they haven't seen it, right? It's like a cat that play ball, and you just see him with his right hand crossover. And you don't know, my man got a left hand crossover. <laughs> my man go behind the back. My man can dunk 360. I feel as if I got all those tools and skills and the world hasn't seen it yet because, you know, the injury, right? The story. And that's great. And I'm thankful for that. But now I'm in a season to where I'm making room for what's happened and transpired beyond that. Yeah. And so, yeah, I'm in that season, man. I'm making room for my gifts, my skills, my abilities, but most importantly, my family. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Any last words before we close out? I don't even yeah. add, tell people, like, you got last words? Absolutely. Like, yeah. you know, but do you have final thoughts before Absolutely. we close out? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Never make a decision when you're in the valley. 
Hmm. Always remember that. Never make a life decision when you're in the valley. Hmm. Because oftentimes, when we're at our lowest, when we go through adversity, opposition, when something is tough, we make a permanent decision over temporary condition. Never make a permanent decision when you're in the valley. Keep fighting. Survive it. Keep fighting, surviving, never make a permanent decision when you are in the middle of a valley. There is grace in the valley. I'm so grateful for you today. Thank you for ending Likewise. out my day in such a powerful way. Y'all, we, I'm just, I'm so full. My cup runneth over. Thank y'all so much for joining us for another episode of Vault Empowers Talks. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, invite somebody in here because let me tell you, this seat over here, it, this seat is 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 becoming okay. It is becoming something that I never even imagined. So thank y'all so much for joining. Until next time, it's your girl Brandy Harvey. Eat well, give a damn, move your body every single day. Peace. <laughs>